you all probably uh, maybe have heard from me. If you haven't, my name is David. I'm a developer advocate on the open search team working at AWS. Um, and we just had our 2.4 release the other day, which is a really big release. I mean, we're talking slides and slides. So we're going to try and cover it at a really super high level. Um, get any feedback anyone has, questions, comments, testimonials, and we'll go from there. So I tried to break it down into a couple sections. Um, the first of which is observability. So the big big release on the observability front is the support for Prometheus metrics. Um, so this allows you to pull from Prometheus. I'm not sure PromQL is supported right out of the gate. I think you have to use the PPL. Um, but regardless, uh, you should totally go check that out because that is a really big step from the dashboard side to get proper support for metrics. So you have one kind of pane of glass. Log patterns is super neat. Um, it takes and generates kind of like a fingerprint for your logs based off of the punctuation in it. So these log patterns will look like, you know, square brackets, comma, colon. Um, and what that lets you do is it lets you very quickly look and say, what volume of logs share this kind of common pattern? So you can like dive in on volumes. Um, maybe your logs all have, share the same pattern, in which case this is not gonna be super relevant. Um, but regardless, I think a lot of people have these different log patterns um, and you can apply anomaly detectors to the things along those lines. So check that out and give us some feedback. Also, we have our security analytics plugin, which is experimental. Um, the nice thing is out of the gate, it supports like 2000 some different types of security rules, which are in a standard format whose name escapes me at the moment. But regardless, um, supports all different sorts of log types, Windows logs, um, NetFlows actually, um, and several other very common log patterns. So check out Security Analytics plugin. It is experimental. For those who don't know, experimental means um, we're not making any promises about the API being um, the same between versions. We can make breaking changes to those APIs on minor version changes because they're experimental till we yank that experimental tag. So, boy. Uh, so we have a bunch of new search features as well, all of which are experimental. This was a big experimental release. Um, we have the neural search plugin, which allows you to get started more readily with semantic search. So that's gonna be for anyone using like document or product search. Um, that kind of goes alongside with the integrate your own ML model. So allowing you to import some natural language models. Um, and there should be some examples coming out for that here shortly. Um, uh, Nate also asks, are we continuing the pattern of hiding experimental features behind configuration variables? And that is the case as far as I'm aware so far. Um, I'm going to let either Charlotte or DB probably chime in on that one. Um, but they should all be under feature flags that are configuration items. Uh, we have the search relevance plugin, search comparison tool, which allows you to run two searches side by side using uh, different settings, so to speak. And uh, you can compare, like, are the results more relevant? with say neural search compared to BM25? I sure hope so. Otherwise it would be, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure we would launch it, um, but it can help you with tuning your search and making sure you're getting the most relevant examples. Also to open search, I'm gonna call core, but open search the repo. Um, we now have search back pressure, which allows uh, nodes to reject requests. Um, if they're becoming overwhelmed so that we don't end up with crash nodes. We've got point in time search, which is huge because that'll allow you to make a query. And as you're scrolling that query, um, you're going to have the exact same search for as long as the point in time is active. There's a lot of documentation there. Point in time is a pretty deep one, but I think it's gonna do a lot of really um, cool things for anyone, again, in the product search space. 
Um, cluster manager task throttling. I can't speak to that one personally. Searchable snapshots as well. Cannot talk too much to that one. Um, haven't dove in too far on that, but that is experimental. I think from a high level, it just allows you to search your snapshots without having to have the whole index on disk. So um, again, weighted zonal search request, just another one of those ones for reliability. Um, so you don't send it to a zone that's currently struggling with um, lots of trouble, we'll say. And then uh, Windows deployment. We have files now for you to deploy to Windows because I know there are a bunch of you out there that have yeah, Windows machines and servers, mandates from your organization to only ever use Windows. I'm so sorry. Linux is great, um, but we now support you. Um, Additionally, we've got the ability to connect to multiple data sources. Um, that is still experimental, but what that'll allow you to do is with OpenSearch dashboards, you can connect to multiple different OpenSearch clusters. Alongside that, um, we added multi-authentication support. So if those clusters use different authentication methods, um, you can now connect to all of them with your multiple authentication methods. We also have Windows deployment for dashboards. Um, we released, I called this geo, but I'm not sure this is actually a geographic feature because these XY point fields and XY shape fields are on a Cartesian plane. Um, oh yeah, and I'm gonna read Charlotte's comment off. Yeah, just thanks a Charlotte. Yeah, that is wonderful. Um, so those point and shape fields are on a Cartesian plane instead of a normal, you know, latitudinal, longitudinal graph, <laughs> like around the earth. Um, and we also have geohex grid aggregations, which I am sure if you're working in the geospace, you know what those are. I do not. <laughs> I'm, there's only so much one person can learn at a point in time. So, and finally, if you want to check out the release notes, they're chock full of information. They link backlink to um, documentation if it's available. They backlink to um, notes, et cetera. Um, there is a whole bunch in there. So I would really recommend checking out the release notes. And now I'm going to check over Charlotte's thing. Um, one of the things that we realized with this release is we hadn't been consistent on how we're handling and exposing experimental features. So um, some of them are behind config and YAML. Some of them are labeled in the UI. Um, and if you're interested in the topic on how we should experiment, uh, handle experimental features, there's a link there. Um, so with that, wow, I've talked way too fast. There's a lot there. Anyone with questions or comments? I can go back to slides if you want. I have a question about, hi, uh, this is yeah. Amitai Sternum. From, Hi, Amitai. Uh, Dogzio. Um, so I had a question regarding the searchable snapshots. Yeah. Um, I was speaking to some of the folks working on the project, and I was wondering, uh, does this mean there's a new, did they create the new type of node, a searcher node, or is this using mm -hmm. the same data nodes? Someone uh, knows about this. So there, I actually did, I think, see that issue. I think there is the new search node type. As far as I'm aware, that is just a label. Someone might correct me on that, though, as to whether or not that is um, actually used to specify configuration. Hey, uh, this is Andrew Ross, developer. On, oh, uh, Andrew. Uh, Open Search. Um, yeah, so there, there's a new node role. Um, so if you have a, so if you create a searchable snapshot index, then those shards will only be allocated to this new search node. Um, awesome. uh, so it, it's not, it, it, in effect, it ends up being just a label for those allocation purposes. So if you want to have dedicated compute capacity, that's like uh, only for doing the, this like remote searching, that's the purpose of the role. Um, if you don't really care about that, you can just, what are all your data nodes, you can slap on the search role as well. And it will just be your, you know, normal indexes and these uh, searchable snapshot indexes will just be co-located on the same nodes. Awesome, thank you. Actually, one quick question, Andrew. Um, Do you know yeah. if 
by default that node label is applied out of the gate or it is not it is okay. not by default okay. so it's um i th i think for for many maybe most i mean this is something we can sort of sort out as well over time but um i think at least initially we want sort of the um the folks figuring out the cluster topology to be fairly intentional about this because the um particularly as we add in like um a caching layer and additional cache configuration it'll need on these remote nodes um i think for many sort of performance sensitive cases, you'll definitely want to have um, dedicated nodes for this, or at least uh, you'll probably want to have some local nodes that are isolated from from this as well. So um, there's no default here. You, you need to um, uh, put this uh, node role on on the nodes that you want to be performing this function. Um, would these nodes, like, would it make sense to put them in the cluster or would it make sense to have like a separate cluster? Like, uh, they still have to be in the uh, cluster, right? Like it's the, the cluster wait, managers what, if, still. But wait, if, if I used remote, uh, cluster, if I used, um, yeah, remote, uh, data nodes, like, wouldn't that work? Um, sorry, I'm, I'm getting the term probably wrong. Uh, it, so the node role is just called search. Uh, we'll we'll likely use this for additional features in the future as well. But um, the they still have to be a part of the cluster because it is the cluster manager that kind of assigns uh, who does what, and so they all have to be kind of part of that cluster and communicating with the cluster manager and there to receive the assignment. To um, it still does sort of a. Uh, a shard, shard allocation it's 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 more virtual now but it's like uh nodes get provisioned ahead of time of like okay you you are responsible for this uh remote shard of the searchable snapshot all search requests for that are going to come to you um and so that sort of assignment happens a priori uh, just like in the normal case like we haven't touched any of that functionality it's it's more or less the same um so it has to be part of the Mm -hmm. it, it has to be part of the cluster in that it's talking to the cluster manager, right? Um, so how... we, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and a lot of one of the one of the bottlenecks we have, like when I'm um, trying to maintain clusters, there's several bottlenecks, right? You know, uh, CPU, disk space. Um, one of them is just number of shards, right, per node, like how it's distributed. And it's basically also number of shards in the cluster in total. If the manager uh, cluster manager is, is it like we, we've seen cases where cluster manager can be overloaded because of the number of shards um, in the cluster? Would this, I mean, it's got, is it keeping the number of shards also remotely in its, uh, in its memory? Uh, no, we haven't. Uh, so that the, the cluster mo manager bottleneck um, is, is not changed here. If, if that's a bottleneck mm -hmm. for you, that's um, uh, kind of a different problem we'd have to tackle. Um, but the the behavior of it now is like, from the cluster manager perspective, a shard is kind of just a piece of metadata that it assigns to another node to go do work, right? And so that part of it is unchanged. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, if if I might sound like a broken record for a second, uh, there's there's no better replacement than uh, going and pulling two point uh, four, installing it, and playing around. Uh, I have yet to do that, uh, embarrassingly enough, but uh, I do consider that part of my responsibility. Uh, and it it helps, even just looking for the new buttons and clicking things and breaking things. That's just how I roll. Any other questions for uh, uh, Mr. Tippett here or any of the developers online? Uh, thank you for joining us, by the way. I appreciate that very much. Uh, it's an awkward I situation when I can't one. answer questions. Go ahead. I, I do have another question uh, regarding search back, back pressure which is an awesome feature. We've been seeing a lot of cases where 
uh, you know, evil search, we call them killer searches, where it just kills the cluster. Someone decides to send um, massive, you know, leading wildcard regex uh, on, on huge amounts of data and just all the nodes go up to 100 CPU and pretty much everything's blocked. So in search back pressure, we've seen this case where someone will send a really heavy search. It could be a, you know, it's, it's a needle in haystack finding which one it is. And then all the other searches kind of get queued up behind it. So is search back pressure handling the surge of searches coming or is it handling that specific one search that causes the mess? I'm just gonna see if Charlotte is still on and could answer that question. That's a really good question though. Yeah, so if I'm, just so I understand the question right, if a, if a node is processing a search that sends it up to 100% CPU, will that, uh, you know, will that uh, search uh, 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 back pressure uh, yeah. prevent the smaller uh, searches from occurring or will it pause the big one that's uh, causing all of the hiccup? Yeah, more or less. Like, are yeah. we going to count? Is the back pressure relevant to the heavier search or is it relevant to the search queue that uh, follows it? So I'd probably, I'd recommend going back and checking. There is an RFC open for that. If I remember correctly, I think it is just for that individual search. I think it will take that individual search, recognize that, hey, you know, um, this search is killing killing this node. So we're not going to go and let it start, you know, roaming around, so to speak. Um, and would probably back push push back on just that one search request. But I'd need to double check on that. Yeah, I saw Charlotte okay. unmute for just a split second, not to put you on the spot there. No, it's fine. I did unmute, uh, but my answer wasn't going to be any more satisfying uh, that I have to double check on it as well. But yeah. I will, I'll circle back with you, Emma Ty. Great. Thanks, Charlotte. Yeah. Actually, Emma Ty, a question to you. You'd mentioned the um, issue with uh, the coordinators not being able to maintain with the number of shards. Do you have an open issue for that? Uh, you mean the cluster manager? Sorry, um, yeah, cluster manager, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, I mean, it, it's kind of a, an odd situation because you can make the cluster manager bigger, right? Like the instance, right. you could beef it up and then you're probably going to be fine. Um, and it's, I, I, don't, I don't know if many folks have tried this, but it's really hard to sort of understand what the actual number of shards per node is the one that really um is blocking you it's uh sometimes it could be a thousand uh sometimes we could reach nearly two thousand everything's fine and sometimes mm. 500 is really bad it depends on the data and the way the cluster is being used um but uh, in general it's recommended by in many documentation uh in uh, a lot of the documentation not to have too many shards in the uh, cluster but i have i have not seen a, a ticket open on it i don't know if that's it's like a symptom or the actual issue. Well, that's interesting. I think we should dive into that though at some point because that's that level of instability and like not knowing uh, what that threshold is and if you've reached it, you know, like like you said, not not knowing uh, is a thousand going to be fine on this node type. That's that's a real uh, a challenge, and it sounds like something that just takes a bit of experience. Um, Looks like yeah. DB just dropped some science in the chat there uh, that might yep. clarify a few things. Yeah. Okay, yeah. It looks like actually for DB's comment, um, it doesn't look specific to a specific query. It looks like it just tracks memory and CPU usage and then rejects running uh, or starts canceling running searches when the threshold's oh. breached. Awesome. Thanks, Stevie. It sounds yeah. kind of like a circuit breaker per search, I guess. I mean, it kind of sounds like that. And regarding the roles, what I was asking is like, would it be better to, oh, we'll, we'll test this out, of course, but I, I was thinking of an architecture where I have several clusters. I don't need many searcher nodes and I, and I would like to scale them down, you know, like when I don't need them. Yeah. So in a region, it would make sense maybe to have a remote cluster serving the searcher nodes for all retention have it scaled all the way down and only scale up for the entire region rather than have 
say two nodes per cluster. I'm just trying to think how uh, out of the box trying to save uh, on instances being up for no reason. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of good things we can discuss uh, there. Um, for okay, so so the, we have two themes here on back pressure. Very quickly, the RFC is is pretty thoroughly explaining what the limitations of circuit breakers are. So these do act like circuit breakers, except they're at a different level. They're at the search query level, so it's much more fair and uh, fine grained. Um, and uh, it, it it's an improvement that. Uh, that has been tested uh, in all kinds of workloads and production in the uh, AWS managed service. So they've kind of worked backwards from the majority of the problems that we're seeing in that service. So I, I have high confidence that these things work. But the end goal of all of this is probably a uh, real a framework that can uh, run a query plan and evaluate what the cost of that query is going to be and start allocating uh, not just reacting to uh, overly high CPU usage and uh, high memory usage, but also allocate fairly based on the query plan. That's not work that has been done, but that's the kind of the end goal. I think of a lot of this, a lot of this work. It will meet it in the middle somewhere between back pressure and query planning. Uh, for the uh, for the other one, you've mentioned a lot of problems that we know about. In, and that we've heard about, I think it's a great place to start to bring your own narrow one that you've experienced into a GitHub issue. And then we should connect it to either some work that's already being done by other people or formal, or maybe uh, create some work for ourselves around that. Generally, the cluster manager is a huge bottleneck in large deployments. We'd like to get rid of it. Not sure how, though. So, uh, no. If you want to delete. You mean no, no cluster manager? Kind of like. Uh... Kafka-esque kind of uh, situation. I mean, that sounds ideal, but what are the underwater uh, minds in deleting cluster? I tried to delete cluster management and nothing worked. So <laughs> I think it's not that simple. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it would work very well. Um, search back pressure is really interesting to us. Uh, I mean, one of the, one of the uh, pitfalls that I could see, I mean, we're gonna have to test it. The idea is that it's like, um, <laughs> yeah, Kafka-esque is definitely uh, you know, studying Kafka myself. It's different. Uh, it's weird in, in IT. Um, yeah. So search back pressure is like, there's, a, there's an issue there where I could have, let's say a customer would set up an, an alert uh, or a rule. Rules are very similar to alerts in Logzo, and it's basically a, a timed query, right? Um, and their query could be very reasonable when they set it up. But then, like search back pressure may start kicking in because they start sending data that their query. I mean, if you query basically no data, it's a very quick query. It does create pressure on the cluster. We've measured that even querying a cluster that has barely any data will cause pressure. But if you add data that's like huge documents and you have a regex in there, suddenly your query will probably cause the search back pressure to kick in, right? Well, so it's we, like, um, it's not the query's fault, it's the data now. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's exactly why search back pressure exists, is to avoid that. Meaning that it should only kick in when you are going to exceed the thresholds that are reasonable to execute. Meaning that if you're going to kill a node by doing this kind of query, then maybe that query should fail before it brings the node down yeah uh yeah but but when you want to plan the query then it's like you have to know the data in order to plan the query it's very hard uh thinking forward on what you were saying earlier uh, on creating yeah. a query plan that's why they did search back pressure before they did query planning because that's a much easier thing to grok you set the limit and you say like 90 percent ram and uh heap usage uh, planning does imply knowing whether you're going to do a full data scan, whether it's going to be distributed, collecting all the data. But databases do it quite well today, like SQL Server. And uh, in theory, we should be able to do it uh, at least well like that. But uh, it's not an easy problem. But wouldn't it be... Oh, thanks. So how much the query will take allows you to load balance all these things in a much smarter way. 
I think that separating search from indexing is probably like segment replication brings us so close to that that it would probably be the uh, you know the, the next step because I think that you know the queries they kind of like half the pressure on the cluster half and half half indexing half queries in many cases though so it seems like even just separating it maybe a, a good middle solution in between search back pressure and the planning yeah andrew uh you've with um with the remote snapshot search uh do you think it's doable to make a cluster that where search nodes are truly separate from indexing nodes and what are the trade-offs um so with with what's like available in 2.4 i don't think it's practical but like we are uh um I mean, the, the reason that we're building searchable snapshots is not necessarily because the searchable snapshot feature is like kind of the end all be all. It's really the incremental building step to um, what Amitai is talking about. Um, so the the we're we're adding kind of the technical pieces to get there. Absolutely. Um, it's not quite ready to wire everything up yet with um and then even e the searchable snapshot piece is really about the and coupled with the other feature that was that's still in process and was uh, initially released in 2.3, the remote backed index, where you're sort of continually updating your index uh, or continually sort of syncing your leucine segments to the remote storage. We can couple those together and get kind of that split um, split architecture. Like we're definitely working towards that. Um, and then even with segment replication without having any remote storage at all, um, there's the possibility of, of sort of just changing who, which node does what, and then you would, could get those isolated indexers in search, but um, it's not quite possible now without getting there and hacking stuff, hacking stuff up. But yes, we, we are working towards that for sure. Do you have a release in mind where this will become possible? Uh, I I don't have a uh, a specific release targeted just yet. No, we're uh, working on uh, getting all that planned and and figuring out where that's going to be. Cool. Amita, you're making pull requests, right? I will start making a bunch of pull requests and uh, uh, based on the first part of the talk, I'll move, move towards that as well. <laughs> I really De definitely, like... definitely dig in and, and like open those issues with the specific, like you have some very specific complaints, right? And like um, your bottlenecks and the experiences and, and, and all of those, like getting that on, you know, as part of the discussion is definitely super helpful. It, it feels uh, like uh, you're almost building a house, you know, no matter how smart your appliances are, you got to have the fuse box there first uh, so you don't blow everything up. Just look to the, at the chat, I think, um, and Alejandro, I mean, cross-cluster search, that was what I was trying to say earlier <laughs> with regards to the, uh, I was also asking, uh, that, that's what I meant regarding the um, searcher nodes, having cross-cluster search with like a searcher node uh, cluster and all the rest, like without them. Uh, sorry for hijacking your question. Um, anyway, thanks for everybody who answered. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't, I don't have a a, a great answer um, with how that can play with uh, cross cluster oh. search, but uh, like specifically searchable snapshots leverage with cross cluster search i'm not sure how those two would work together but like the i get your point about like you want to have um you're talking about like something that would be uh could be considered sort of like fairly cold storage in that you don't need a lot of requests but you want to be able to search things on demand and so you don't want to provision a lot of compute capacity for it but you want to have some there right and uh, it definitely makes sense. Yeah. And I didn't want to hijack the other questions. So, so Hendra had a totally different question, which I think uh, merits its own 
space. Sorry. <laughs> He's asking the difference between multiple data sources and cross cluster search. I think I can take that one. Um, so multiple data sources allows you to have uh, multiple different and very distinct separate clusters. So these clusters are clusters that don't talk to each other, but you would be able to query them with the same instance of dashboards. So before you were kind of tied in a one-to-one -one relationship, you spun up a dashboards instance, you spun up an open search cluster, and they were tethered together. Um, this kind of decouples that and allows you to run multiple open search instances, which maybe someone will do for, you know, compliance reasons. Maybe they have different um, auditing requirements um, as far as like where the data is physically located. Um, so that's that's an example of why um, someone would use that multiple data sources versus a cross cluster search where the cross cluster search, it's genuinely kind of all works as the same cluster, we'll say. Good question. I think it's also a prelude to being able to add different things. Like I, this is something I wanted yes. for a while, maybe the ability to add like a SQL uh, database yeah. as, a, as a lookup for, for my data, because a lot of my data just contains, let's say, um, I don't know, some user ID, which is not human readable. Yeah. You create a dashboard, you want to send it to an executive and show them something that they can read if they are looking at a bunch of numbers you know like ids it doesn't really tell them much but if you could use a lookup of an existing database and you know change those ids into something uh, that you don't have you, there are, there are lookups today in open search dashboards you have to statically um, put them in it's it's not as comfortable as having it hooked up yeah um, the uh, follow-up question was asked, is this going to allow non-compatible Elasticsearch open search data sources? Um, I couldn't say specifically if someone wants to contribute that and it's compatible, then I don't see why not. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a good question. It's, it's up to the community really. Um, but yeah, I, on that, on I think it was Amitai's uh, point, I think it's actually enabling Prometheus as well to be visualized on dashboards, but oh, we are just about at time. So I'm gonna hand back over to Nate for closing, but we'll hang around after we close. And uh, if anyone has any other questions. Awesome. Yeah, I was gonna let that conversation go on as uh, long as I could. Um... I, I have nothing else for the good of the order. Uh, if anyone else does, you're, you're welcome to share it, but uh, I'm gonna go ahead and scroll to see you next time. Oh my gosh, I'm being rung for another meeting. Decline.